Hi, everyone, and welcome. We'll go ahead and get started in just a moment. All right. Thank you everyone for joining us today for Massachusetts Legislature 101, how to affect change and engage with legislators. This session is being offered um, in honor of MOBA's Victim Rights Month commemoration as one of the several workshops we've offered throughout the month. We are thrilled to be joined today by several participants for today's session, including Nora Bent. I will take the opportunity to introduce Nora some more in just a moment. Um, we're also joined by Nithya Badrina, Tom King, and Stephanie McCarthy. You'll learn more about each of them a little bit further along during today's session. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to run through some brief Zoom logistics. First and foremost, this is a Zoom, Zoom webinar, which means you cannot be seen or heard as audience members, but you should be able to see the presenters today, as well as the ASL interpreters, and the screen share presentation that is up on the screen right now. If you do have questions during today's session, please feel free to drop those in the Q&A function found at the very bottom of the screen. Questions will be held until the panel discussion portion of today's session. We do have ASL interpretation as well as card captioning available during today's session. If you wish to view those closed captions, you can go down to the bottom of your screen and click on the up arrow next to the closed caption icon and select choose and select show subtitle. If you're having trouble seeing the ASL interpreters today or the closed captions or have any tech issues at all, please feel free to use that chat function and message myself or my colleague Charlotte Hoff or all panelists and someone will happily assist you today. We will kick off today's session with Nora Bent, who will tell us a little bit about the Massachusetts Caucus of Women Legislators, along with the legislative process and what effective advocacy looks like. Following Nora's presentation, we'll have a moderated discussion with our other panelists that will be focused on the process of effective advocacy and what it looks like to really put your advocacy efforts and your plan into action. And with all of that, I'd love to pass things off to Nora. Um, so I'll just tell you all briefly a little bit about her. Um, Nora Bent is currently the executive director of the Massachusetts Caucus of Women Legislators. Prior to this, Nora was a legislative aide and the deputy finance director of the 2018 Yes on Three ballot question campaign to uphold the state's transgender non-discrimination law. Nora is a graduate from American University with degrees in political science, focusing on gender and race politics, as well as political communications. Thank you for being here with us today, Nora. I will let you go ahead and kick us off. Great, thank you so much uh, for having me and I'm really happy to be here and particularly looking forward to the uh, conversation and discussion later. Um, I am going to sort of try to breeze as quickly, but also slowly as possible through my presentation um, so that we can get to questions and that uh, conversation. Um, so as Brenna said, uh, my name is Nora Bent. I'm the executive director of the Massachusetts Caucus of Women Legislators. I will be talking a little bit about the caucus today and particularly our work as it relates to um, sexual violence and other victims rights. Um, uh, policies, and then talk a little bit about the legislative process um, as sort of an overview of the process that can be somewhat complicated to navigate at times. So the Women's Caucus was founded in the mid-70s with a mission to enhance the economic status um, of women and encourage and support women in all levels of government, and that has really been our focus um, up until today. We are a bipartisan and bicameral caucus, so that means that all women legislators, regardless of their political party or whether they serve in the House or Senate, are members of the caucus. For this session, uh, we have 63 members, which puts us at about 31% of the legislature. Um, and as you'll see in the, the last bullet point on this slide, I always love to plug this number because I think it's so 
um, striking of the um, the lengths that we have to go to reach true equity. Um, over the course of Massachusetts government history, um, only 234 women have served compared to over 20,000 men. Um, that 31% number we're at now gets a little bit higher every election cycle, but we still have a ways to go um, and are working hard as a caucus to, to get there. Um, I will also plug our uh, fantastic co-chairs of the caucus this session. Um, Senator Lovely and Rep Kane are uh, working with us to really continue to advance the, the priorities of the caucus. Oh, I'm going the wrong way in my PowerPoint. Um, so the caucus, uh, every session takes a strategic approach to set our priorities. Um, we are a small team and have a lot of work to do in each legislative session. So really try to be focused in the work that we do um, to ensure that we're, uh, we're being effective and not running in the million directions that we could run in. Um, for this session, we have three overarching strategic priorities. Um, and those are determined with a process um, where we take input from all of our members. And really all of our work this session will fall under these three very broad um, topics. The first is around elevating women's economic opportunity and eliminating barriers. The second is around addressing racial and gender disparities in healthcare. And then finally, empowering women in government. And that has really been our, our bread and butter work um, for the full length of the caucus. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go through our legislative priorities one by one, but um, we uh, select bills, again, taking input from our members that fit within our broader strategic priorities to work on throughout the session. Um, so we have five legislative priorities that are on the screen and then a list of 20 endorsed bills, which we support, um, but from a capacity perspective, spend just a little bit less time on. And this full list is on our website as well. And I'm happy to throw that link in the chat later for folks to take a look at. Um, one of the other ways that we work to support our mission is through the work of four different task forces. And these are um, smaller groups led by members to really dive a little bit deeper into some of the policy issues um, that maybe don't show up in our legislative priorities, but are just as important to all of us um, to work on. And the one that I'll talk most about today, given its relevance to the topic, is our sexual violence task force. This is led by Rep. Natalie Higgins and Rep. Tricia Farley-Bouvier. Um, and my guess is that many of the organizations on here have uh, participated in this task force with us. Um, and if anyone has not and is interested in participating, please uh, reach out to me and we would love to have you. Um, we really work to support survivors and bring organizations working in this space together. Um, to both sort of raise awareness and really center the issues that we know all of you are hearing um, and hear from you how we can be most helpful in your work. Um, we know that um, uh, you all <laughs> do a lot of really incredible work and are um, often understaffed and, and low on capacity, particularly when it comes to legislative advocacy. Um, so we are working to support those organizations to effectively advocate, um, make connections with one another, as well as their own local um, elected officials and staff to really bridge those connections between the legislative process um, and the budget process um, and the work that you're doing every day to support survivors. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit now to talk about the legislative process. Um, and again, welcome any uh, questions at the end of the presentation. Um, as folks probably know, um, the legislative process can be complicated and um, I still get <laughs> stuck in it sometimes. Um, and there are many ways that the process can change and nuances that are involved. Um, I'm gonna go through sort of the bare bones of it today and can try to talk through some of those nuances. Um, but I'm also happy to answer questions about specifics if um, if anyone has a, a specific that they want to talk about. So essentially, a bill starts with an idea, something that um, someone is noticing is not working in their community, um, a gap in existing law or a change that needs to happen. And that bill is filed um, at the beginning of a legislative session. 
In Massachusetts, we have two-year legislative sessions, and we actually just began one this past January. So at that time, legislators filed bills. Um, I think there were about 8,000 bills filed. Um, and we are currently right now in the process of reviewing all of those bills. Um, every bill in Massachusetts that's filed goes to a committee. Um, and those committees are based on subject matter. So um, a bill regarding housing policy will go to the housing committee and such. Um, every bill that's sent to committee gets a hearing. Um, and at that time, members of the public, um, as well as other legislators and organizations can testify in support or opposition to the bill um, and share you know, why this bill matters to you. Um, and then the committee takes all of that feedback and sort of internally decides on the bill and what the appropriate next steps are. Um, at that point, the bill can either move forward or stay in committee or go to another committee. Um, and this is where it starts to get a little complicated. So again, happy to answer questions later. Um, and then essentially the bill either goes to another committee or goes to a sort of more process uh, oriented committee, such as the committee on bills in the third reading. Um, this committee really looks for errors in the bill to make sure we're not passing um, policy that is you know, poorly drafted or has grammatical errors or things like that. Um, then a bill goes to the floor. It is officially read a third time, again, coming out of that committee. Um, there's debate on the floor where legislators can offer amendments and suggested changes to the bill. And then ideally at that time, a bill is passed to be engrossed, which means it's passed one chamber. Um, and moves over to the other branch. In that second branch, a lot of this process repeats. Um, it's a little bit simplified at that point because likely that branch has already heard the bill and has some context. Um, so then we walk through that whole process again on the other branch. Um, often this will produce uh, different versions of the bill. So if a bill starts in the house and a certain number of amendments are accepted, and then it goes to the Senate and different amendments are accepted, or if the bill is drafted differently, there will be two versions of the same bill. Um, at that point, both the House and Senate will send the bill to what's called a conference committee, which is made up of members from each branch to really hash out those differences and come to a compromise on the final bill. Once that is once that happens, the bill is um, enacted on an, a sort of up or down simple vote in each chamber and then sent to the governor. At that point, um, the governor can take a few different actions on the bill. She can sign it and then it becomes law. She can um, allow it to become law unsigned. She can veto it or she can amend it. Um, and then the legislature has an ability to override the veto with uh, two thirds of a vote. Um, and we can I can talk about that later. Um, and then the bill becomes law. And this process seems so simple on paper, but as I said earlier, um, there are many nuances that can change the way that it uh, moves forward. Um, I wanna talk through a couple key terms that I think often trip many of us up in this process. Um, I'm gonna go through this rather quickly just in the interest of time, but um, I'm happy to send this out after um, so folks have these definitions. Um, I should also say these are my definitions, not the official sort of dictionary version. Um, and I'm really thinking specific to Massachusetts in these definitions. Um, and some of these are probably uh, familiar to folks. Um, so an amendment, which I'm sure is a term we've all heard, um, is a proposed change to a bill. So once a bill comes out of committee, all legislators have an opportunity to amend it and make appropriate changes um, as they see fit. Um, in Massachusetts, legislators have the ability to co-sponsor a bill. Um, so bills often have one or two lead sponsors in each chamber, and then legislators are able to sign on in support and their names are listed on the bill. Um, it's a very clear way to signal your support of a bill, but I think it is important to note that um, because there are so many bills every session, um, whether or not a legislator has co-sponsored a bill is not always indicative of their support of it. Um, some, we just can't get to all the bills, right? So um, I think there's some nuances there that sometimes can get lost. 
Um, we talked about the conference committee a little earlier. This is when members from each branch uh, meet to um, resolve differences between versions of the bill that have passed the House and Senate. Um, this, uh, the legislature has two different ways that um, the House and Senate can meet, um, informal sessions and formal sessions. Um, informal sessions happen multiple times a week, um, and these are really to consider non-controversial items, um, such as uh, land takings or moving bills back and forth between chambers. Um, and formal sessions is what we really think of when we think of a, a voting session. Um, this is where roll call or other types of votes can be taken, um, and these are typically held Wednesdays and Thursdays. Um, the main difference is that in an informal session, any one member can request a roll call vote. Um, and at that point, um, because there is often not as many people in the chamber on those days, um, the, the discussion would stop and we would sort of pick up another day. Um, there are also two different kinds of votes that we can take, um, roll call votes and voice votes. Um, roll call votes, again, are what we think of when we think of a, a legislative body voting. These are when you vote yay or nay, and each legislator is recorded um, in the vote that they've taken. And these are published online and searchable to anyone. Um, voice votes are a little bit more informal. These are oral expressions of votes, um, and the winner of the votes is decided by whoever is presiding over session. Um, this is when they say, all those in favor say aye, all those opposed nay, and they decide what they hear the most. Um, a poll is how bills move out of committee. Um, a chair of a committee will make a recommendation on a particular bill to either move it forward, keep it in committee, or not continue it in the process. Um, and members of committee vote to either agree with the chair's recommendations or dissent. Um, those happen over email. Um, the last one is, is my favorite. Um, bills that are sent to study um, are essentially the committee's recommendation is that the bill uh, will not be considered further. Um, this is usually the end of the road for a bill in a two-year legislative session, um, and we call it sending it to study. Um, shifting gears for the last time uh, to talk a little bit about um, effective advocacy, which I think is probably why we're all here today. Um, I think there are a lot of ways to do this, and um, the, for me, the most important thing to remember is that um, your own personal experience is what is most important. Um, none of us are experts on everything, so it's bringing your own voice to the table and being willing to um, share why something is important to you and how you are willing to help sort of move it forward. Um, so obviously it is important to educate yourselves on the issues that you care about and want to advocate for, um, but it's important to remember that you do not have to be an expert on everything. Um, again, bringing your own, um, your own story is the most important thing, and if you are not a, a policy wonk who knows the ins and outs of every bill, that is okay. Um, there is not an expectation of you to be, um, you know, a, a scholar in each of the bills you're working on. Um, understanding the landscape and the legislative process is also important. Um, just understanding where you are in the process, if a bill has already had a committee hearing, if it's uh, moved through chambers in previous sessions, and sort of how you can plug into that is important. Um, building relationships with your own elected officials and their staff. Um, as a, a staffer, um, I often think that staff can be overlooked in this process. Um, Staff are uh, often the ones putting things in front of their boss, and um, it is just as important to have good relationships with their staff and, and have those conversations with staff um, so that they can help you advocate effectively to the, the legislator. Um, and then remembering that advocacy changes throughout the process. So the way that I like to think of it is that advocacy is needed most importantly anytime a bill moves or changes or for any big votes. Um, these are the moments when you will need to be doing letters of testimony and encouraging your legislators to vote a certain way on a bill. Um, and these often happen quickly. So staying sort of attuned to the process as best you can um, is really helpful to be ready in these key moments. 
And then in all of the other times when bills are not actively moving, um, I like to think of it as really building support and building coalition behind a bill, taking advantage of those quieter moments to say, you know, I hope you have a moment to read this bill. I want to talk about why it's important and um, really that education and sort of outreach phase. Um, a couple tips and tricks, and I'm including this photo mostly just because I love it. Um, and to remind everyone that legislators are humans, um, our Women's Caucus Board met with the governor and lieutenant governor last week and obviously took a selfie because that is what you do. Um, and I know from my own personal experience, um, it can be really intimidating to walk into the state house and advocate to your elected officials. Um, but it's important to remember that these folks, um, they represent you and they want to hear from you. And they are humans who've been in the same spot as you, um, learning about a bill, asking those questions. Um, I promise <laughs> we are all not scary and hard uh, to approach. Um, and again, your personal experience is the most important thing you can bring to the conversation. So it is okay if you don't have all the answers, as long as you are willing to share um, you know, what you're comfortable sharing. And that can be challenging, particularly in, in this policy space, but um, sharing why something matters to you and why you're taking time out of your day to advocate for it is all that you need to do. Um, and it is okay to say that you don't know an answer to a question they ask and then follow up later or connect uh, connect them with someone who will know the answer. Um, asking how you can help is really important. Um, how you can help raise awareness. Um, legislators will tell you if they are struggling to get support for a bill or struggling to understand who's involved. Um, those are all ways that you can be helpful. And asking that question up front, I think, goes a long way in, in uh and building that relationship and earning that uh, trust and sort of mutual respect. Um, and then taking advantage of the others working in this space. So MOVA is a great example of this um, and other uh, organizations on this call, knowing that they are um, uh, maybe have gone through the process before and can help guide you um, or help tell you who to talk to to, um, to really understand where you can be most effective. Um, I included a few resources here, and again, happy to send this out after, um, of ways to find your legislator. Um, and this, I think, is important to find your legislator of your, your own home, so your personal rep. Um, and then if your organization works in a particular area, finding everyone who works there. So if you're a um, North Shore, North Shore uh, focused organization, finding all of the legislators that serve your constituents as well um, and connecting with them. And then the MA legislature website, um, you can find all legislation that's been filed, uh, bills that are before committees, and then you can live stream all of our sessions and our hearings. Um, a few more resource resources here, uh, my email address, I'm always happy to chat. Um, I love talking about advocacy, so happy to, to answer questions. Um, the Women's Caucus website to learn more about our members or our priorities. Um, again, the main legislature website, and then the glossary that's on our website that is a great way to look up specific terms or questions if you have them um, as you're going through your process. Um, and that is my last slide. So I'm happy to turn it back over to uh, Brenna, I think, um, and take any questions. Thank you, Nora. Um, that was a really helpful overview of the legislative process in Massachusetts. And thank you even more um, for just the work that you and your colleagues do to support survivors through the Women's Caucus, through the Sexual Violence Task Force. Um, you all have been amazing partners. Um, and as you noted, the legislative process is often not intuitive. Um, you know, there are a lot of different paths that legislation can take um, and a lot of different nuances. So Having partners such as yourself and the caucus who are focused on bringing all of us, the rest of us, into the conversation and into those discussions is so valuable. So thank you for that. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Stephanie McCarthy, and I am the Deputy Chief of Staff at MOVA, and I lead our policy and legislative advocacy work throughout the agency. I am honored uh, for the next segment of today's presentation 
to be joined by um, some additional policy experts in the victim service field who work every day to advance the rights and services available to crime victims throughout Massachusetts. I have had the pleasure of working directly with our panelists, Tom, Nithya, and Nora on many shared priorities over the years, and they each bring a very unique perspective to the work that I know everybody on this call will learn a lot from. So before getting into some actual questions, um, I'm just gonna ask each panelist to introduce themselves briefly. Um, Nithya, if you wanna start, I'll kick it off to you. Thanks so much, Stephanie. And thanks so much, Nora. That was such a great presentation. I always forget everything in the legislative process, so it's really great to have that refresher. Hi, everyone. So great to be here. My name is Nithya Badrinath. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the policy manager at Jane Doe, Inc. It's the Massachusetts State Coalition Against Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence. So just a little bit about JDI. Um, so each state has its own sexual assault and domestic violence coalition. So we are Massachusetts federally and state recognized coalition. Um, some have separate sexual assault and domestic violence coalitions. We are a dual coalition. So um, we're both domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, so we're made up over 60 member programs, which are direct service organizations that include community-based programs, hospital-based program, programs located in campuses, rape crisis centers, culturally specific programs, and more. In my role, I focus on legislative budget and systems advocacy, which involves working closely with our members and partner organizations to come up with advocacy strategies and respond to policies that impact survivors of sexual and domestic violence, teen dating violence, stalking, and human trafficking. Um, prior to working at JDI, last summer I graduated from Tufts University, where I was involved in a lot of civic engagement related work and also interned for State Rep. Christine Barber, where Nora was my supervisor and I learned everything I know from her um, for three years. Um, and I focused on research related to um, incarcerated women in Massachusetts, um, housing and constituent services. Um, yeah, thank you so much, and I'm excited to be here and have this conversation. Great, thank you, Nithya. Tom? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tom King. I'm the Executive Director for the Massachusetts Children's Alliance. For those of you who don't know us, we are the coalition of the 12 children's advocacy centers across the state. Um, we're a closed coalition, meaning that all of those centers are um, part of Mass Children's Alliance, and um, there are no other advocacy centers in Massachusetts. We're fortunate for that. Um, these are specialized uh, centers which streamline the criminal and care protective investigations when allegations of child sexual assault, human trafficking, and severe physical abuse are raised. In addition to coordinating those investigations, these centers are able to um, offer services or arrange for services for children, whether those include mental health services or specialized medical care. Um, in my role as executive director, it feels like we are constantly advocating for funding for our centers. And um, although we have wonderful uh, champions in both the House and Senate, it is constant. Um, and even before we get into some of the questions, I, I loved so much of what Nora had said. And one of the things that our group has learned, um, it's really important, is not to just knock on your legislators' door when you need them, but to involve them in your work. Um, and one of the, the occasions that I had that has highlighted that is we're really pleased to be part of the Massachusetts Child Sexual Abuse Prevention Task Force, which is a legislatively convened task force. And that group has been incredibly powerful in promoting really effective interventions for children, prevention initiatives through Safe, Safe Kids Thrive, as well as um, one of our initiatives, which addresses problematic sexual behavior in children. So um, our work, cannot happen without the strong partnership of the legislature. And um, it is uh, something I thought was an occasional task and it really is woven into the very work that we do. And it, it kind of has to be. So that's my intro. Thanks, Tom. And Nora will also be participating. Nora, I don't know if there's anything you want to add. Um... No, I feel like I've talked too much. So happy to just get to questions. 
Awesome. Well, you have not talked too much and we're looking forward to uh, more of your input, but thank you all for um, introducing yourselves and joining MOVA today. Um, we're going to move into a question and answer format. Um, this is based on questions that we received during the registration process um, and just kind of other general questions that we've all been asked um, that we thought was helpful um, for a more general audience. Um, our goal for this workshop is to really just share foundational strategies and high level tactics so that you feel better prepared to engage with the legislature to advance the rights of survivors, whether that's on behalf of yourself as an individual, a program, a provider, or a larger organization. So the first question I'm gonna uh, ask my panelists are, how do you even start the process of advocating for legislation? What does that look like? Um, and I'll, instead of calling on somebody, I'll just kind of open it up to the three of you and uh, whoever wants to take the lead on that. I can I can start. Um, yeah, I think the honestly, the hardest part of advocacy is not knowing where to start. Um, I think the legislative process can be kind of very un inaccessible for a lot of people and folks don't know like where their power is and how they can actually get involved. And I think the first step is actually really just understanding um, what the legislative process is and where to begin as Nora covered. Um, and then kind of establishing Step one is kind of knowing what issues are important to you. Like, is it safe and affordable housing for survivors you work with, strengthening sexual assault uh, protection orders, or making sure your organization um, is receiving the necessary funding to continue supporting survivors? I think just knowing this, um, like what you are advocating for is the most important step. Um, and if you're in direct service, that's the most important kind of advocacy. And it can be easily translated to legislative advocacy because there are two like really important things that you should know is that your legislator is accountable to you as a constituent and that if you are a survivor or you work with survivors, you know what is best and what's needed by impacted communities. Um, so I think that's like the first step is actually just knowing what issues that you care about and just kind of understanding where uh, you can plug in and then you can yeah contact your legislator, staff, set up meetings and develop those relationships, you can actually um, communicate those needs. Yeah, I uh, agree with everything Nithya said. And I think um, I think it's also understanding that legislators are by nature connectors to other people. Um, so, you know, whether it's going to your own legislator's office hours or if you're in the state house, just popping in to say hi, um, I feel like it's those informal conversations that can really get you connected to an organization that's doing this work or, um, you know, they'll say, have you heard about this bill or this budget item? And that's a really great way to just better understand the landscape. Um, to Nithya's point, I think that is the hardest part is getting started, um, but being willing to just have those informal conversations and and connect with your legislators and um, sort of see where it goes, I think is a is a good way to just get get your foot in the door. Yeah, and I would add seriously, take a deep breath. Um, and look at um, what you're going to be taking on. Um, and if possible, if it isn't, um, you know, a really big budget issue that has a huge uh, timeline that you have to be responsive to, really to um, take a deep breath. It's, it is uh, often intimidating. Um, and when you realize that folks, um, as, as Nora said, are there to help you. Um, you know, some of the most helpful folks that we have worked with are those who staff the offices. Um, and not only with your topic, but how to navigate uh, the, the uh, system you're about to enter. And I would say, you know, as you are coming up with uh, legislation in your, your, your strategy, I'd also take some time to look around to see if someone else has been successful in doing what you are proposing to do and, and ask them, um, have a virtual cup of coffee with them and say, what was that like for you? What, what did you learn? And really take the time to um, learn. It sounds uh, silly, but it, it builds your confidence and to bring in people who know more than you. And um, more often than not, particularly in our arena, those folks are gonna wanna help you. So I think that really starting in that way 
and demystifying it for yourself is a really strong foundation to then spring into some action and um, build on that plan. Thank you all. Those are, are really great answers. And I think the theme is, you know, we're all coming at it as humans. So that approach is so important. And just like Nora said, we as advocates are not always experts, you know, in, in the process or the subject matter. Neither are some of the people we're talking to, but it's always about building that network and that coalition. And I think um, also, I think Nora alluded to this earlier in her presentation, but never underestimate the value of staff. So sometimes legislators themselves may not be available um, or may not be the person responding to your email or your call, um, but the staff is very much the lifeline of the office um, in many, in most instances. Um, so please don't let that be a deterrence um, if, you know, if you're only able to connect with staff because there is so much value there. Um, and follow up to that question. So you've identified a problem, um, you wanna start exploring a change. What does it look like to develop the strategy uh, to do so? What do you consider when creating that strategy? And if you can use an example um, in your talking points, that would be great as well. Thank you. Tom, do you want to start? Sure. So um, I could speak to an example where I think many people were involved, and that was our advocacy effort last year for the VOCA Bridge. And, um, and that is an example where there was some urgency, and there was a lot of um, legitimate anxiety and concern. What's going to happen to our field? What's going to happen to um, folks who have specialized skills and just an ability to work with survivors? What would our landscape look like if it were depleted? And what I really drew from um, the collective effort was making sure that everyone was comfortable with what we were asking for. And that sounds so basic, but in that enthusiasm to help, you wanna also take the time to say, hey, can you join on? And do you understand what we're asking for? So, and, and we all, and I will talk, I'll put myself in the equation, we are all folks who wanna help. So sometimes we'll say yes, and then we're like, oh gosh, what the heck did I just agree to? <laughs> um, and, it means you're know, understanding, you know, what, what's what's an amendment? I'm not sure I know what that process is. And oh wait, what what's that terminology that person is using? Is that industry jargon that's going to be um, relatable to the rest of um, or just to the general public? And I, in working with um, my colleagues across the spectrum of victim services, boy, everyone um, really just we slowed each other down. We encouraged each other. We helped those who just were overwhelmed and might not have had the bandwidth to put into those efforts. And it didn't matter. Collectively, we settled on a really strong message. And um, I think through that, what I learned is, again, um, making sure as you bring people on that they feel comfortable talking about the issue, right? So taking the time to do that, being obviously aware of whatever the, the deadline is that, that's looming and the urgency and making sure that that urgency doesn't necessarily dictate your behavior, right? So you wanna make sure that we're all so impassioned with our work. And understandably, we were, a lot of us were just unbelievably taken aback that our wonderful work of decades could be just um, gutted. And so we have to check in with each other and say, okay, um, we're gonna be testifying. Is everyone feeling grounded? Is everyone feeling okay? And does everyone really understand what we're gonna be talking about? And taking that time to do that is important. So um, I guess I'd, I'd, I'll stop by saying, by assessing who are your strongest folks, who are folks that are really willing, but may not be um, as well-schooled at the moment, and then laying out your plan that way and just asking a lot of questions of those folks who are supporting you. Do you understand what we're doing? Can I explain, explain it better to you? Or can I help you as you reach out to folks to garner support? Yeah, I um, I really appreciate that focus on sort of the collective. Um, you know, I think everyone who's participating will bring something different to it, whether it's an understanding of the process and maybe one person has a, a really powerful personal story they can share and one person sort of a, a fiscally minded person. And when you bring all of that together, I think it really sets you up for success. Um, 
and also really appreciate that balance between the urgency and taking care of yourself. Um, I know that's something that I struggle with of, oh my God, this is a, a crisis. <laughs> um, and how do I move forward in it while A, taking care of myself and B, um, still being strategic and effective and not, you know, panicking. Um, and that is hard. Um, I also think it's um, sort of tailoring your message for your audience. So thinking through, if you're talking to, um, you know, us, people who are on your team and are really sort of get the human angle of this, that's a very different message than if you're talking to the, the budget writers who are overwhelmed and looking at the numbers because that's what their job is and that's what they have capacity in that moment to do. Um, tailoring what what your message is and, and being flexible with that. Um, I think we all know what is most important to us to communicate, but but putting yourself in that other person's shoes to understand the nuances of it or a specific angle of it, I think can be really helpful in just getting on the same page faster um, to be able to, to be successful in the end. Yeah, totally second everything that was said. Um, I think it's just the legislature is super, it's super daunting really trying to get involved in advocacy work. It's scary. Um, I think for me, like I always, there are times where I do panic and get frustrated. I think it's like, okay to, you know, take that time for yourself and schedule time for freakouts and things like that. Because there are some times where legislature moves super quickly, things are happening way too fast. And like, before you actually figure out what's happening, you have to like react. And there are other times where things move super slowly. So there can be frustration on like both levels that things aren't moving or things are moving way too quickly and kind of just understanding like when are these times that I can like actually you know like tune in and like be in that headspace where I can work on this and also then I can and then knowing that okay this is a time where the legislature is not that active so here I can take time for myself and also focus on that building that coalition um, and not really focusing on like responding to the legislature so I think relationship building is key with everything, especially um, advocating for legislation and especially um, in like every process um, involving legislature. I can talk about the budget, for example, because we're knee deep in budget season and this is one of the times where things are happening pretty quickly. Um, so just like first kind of knowing your ask, like what are you asking for, for us um, with VOCA cuts that will seriously impact the ability of our programs to maintain services and support victims and survivors. We're really asking the legislature to support all avenues to mitigate the harms from the federal level. So we're advocating for funding for the Department of Public Health. And since funding is the most important thing um, that we're advocating for in general and all of our advocacy, we really need to involve all of our member programs as much as possible and alert the legislature at every possible avenue and level that um, let them know what we're advocating for specifically. Um, and I think that in this specific process, the House has their own process and the Senate follows. So we have to be plugged in at kind of like every level and kind of rehash what we're trying to say and make sure that our message is super clear. So not just having that ask, but make sure you're really clear and concise and really can communicate um, what you can to the best ability, because like Nora said, I think there are the budget people are just looking at numbers specifically. So making sure that specific number is as clear as possible. And if you're giving testimony or talking about it here at a hearing, like your stories, your personal experiences are super important. And it's another thing, it's gonna be super scary to communicate that I'm someone who doesn't like public speaking, but it's super important to kind of, you know, share your story, share your experiences, because they're so important and you can do so much by uh, bringing that experience to legislature. So there are different ways, um, essentially you can advocate um, and build strategy, but like everyone said, like relationship building, like taking time for yourself and understanding like what actually you need to do here and like what you actually are asking for is um, really important in building a strategy. Thank you all. Um, relationship building certainly is a huge factor. Um, and I think it is very dependent on what exactly you're looking for and who your kind of stakeholders, even within the legislature are. Um, something that I think 
with the Voca Bridge, um, as Tom, um, you know, was explaining, was a real all hands on deck approach. I'm sure everybody on this call, um, I know my panelists absolutely, and then I'm sure everybody um, who's in the audience, you know, was involved in that in some way. Um, and something that I think gave a lot of credibility to this coalition that we had built um, was a lot of the data that we could share as well. Um, you know, we were able to actually pull from all of the um, reports that you provide um, to MOVA, obviously, as the administrator of the funding, but how much money was going to each community. So not even a statewide approach, but this really localized effort so that every legislator understood what was at stake for their constituents. And having that approach to really look at things from a local level versus this statewide problem, this looming black cloud that everybody knows is coming. Um, but when they actually see, you know, my community in Swampscott, Massachusetts is going to be cut by X amount of money, that really um, mobilizes folks. So to whatever extent data um, can be part of your advocacy request, I think that's also really important to highlight. Um, obviously, sometimes that's easier um, to kind of put to pull together than other times. Um, but I know that that's something that certainly builds up credibility as well. So thank you all. And so now we, you know, we've identified the problem. We've put together a strategy. We know who our audience is. We know who we're going to be talking to. How do you then put that plan into action? Um, I think there's a lot of creative ways that, you know, advocacy can look like. Um, so I'm curious, you know, what our panelists think about, you know, actually putting that strategy into fruition. Nora, do you want to start? Sure. Um, yeah, I think there's a really um, fine balance that I personally struggle with, so I don't have an answer um, of, of keeping up the momentum while also not being overwhelming for lack of a better term. Um, I think it is, um, it always strikes me how many issues there are in everything that we debate, right? So the budget is a really good example of, um, there are some 1500 amendments. Um, it is impossible to know everything about all of those amendments. So figuring out how to get your message really clearly about amendment number you know, 500 or whatever it is, um, and keeping that at the top of people's minds while also not emailing every hour of the day for a week is, is really hard. Um, and I wish I had like a magic formula for that. Um, I think that's also where the relationship building we talked about earlier comes in of, you know, Steph can call me and say, this amendment is really important to us. And I, I got it right. I'm, I don't need a thousand reminders. I I trust Steph's judgment on what's what's important to MOVA and to the community and can sort of take that and run with it. Um, so I, I feel like that's not a great answer, but I think it's being mindful of, of that line of keeping the momentum, being willing to send reminders and have those conversations while also um, relying on the relationships you've built and relying on the other people that are doing similar advocacy to to continue sort of beating that drum. I'm, I can add if, if you'd like, uh, Stephanie, um, you know, when <clears throat> putting it into action, I think you have to also be prepared for feedback. Um, and to be willing to do, uh, to make that feedback. And one of the things we learned early on, and we were grateful that we got the feedback, was to be very careful of industry jargon um, and be careful of the assumed knowledge. Um, and, you know, if you're going to ask someone, and I'm talking more about mobilizing folks, if you're going to ask folks to get on board with you, be really, really careful not to say, well, this trauma-informed, multidisciplinary, teamed approach to survivors, they're going to say, wait a minute, what? Do I need to know all of that? You know, and to make sure that folks understand what you're saying, right? And um, even if you have to start by saying, well, this legislation is to help children who um, unfortunately have been victims of crime, and we want to make sure that they can lead healthy and productive lives. And sometimes, even though that sounds really basic, because that isn't what we say every day, we're uncomfortable, and then we're going to a legislator. So it actually takes practice, and you should get comfortable with kind of that, um, 
that language that is a little more, dare I say, elementary. And, you know, the, the line is if when you're testifying in court, pretend you're talking to folks in, or children in the eighth grade, because it'll stop you from using overly complicated terms. And it's not necessarily assuming the intelligence of people. That's not my point. My point is to really monitor yourself. Have I used jargon that someone's not going to understand? Am I inadvertently going to be a little off-putting because I'm fervent and I, I really am talking about this very, very specific thing and they don't know what you're talking about? So I think it's making sure that as you do roll out your plan, you have some folks that can give you feedback. Hey, that email was too confusing for me. I didn't understand what you're asking. I think you should just have the button right there. Boom. And, you know, being nimble there and not and being OK with getting that feedback, I think is really important. The other thing I'm going to say um, is also be aware of people who may not be in support of your work, um, maybe not against the philosophy of what you're doing, but they're not happy that you're going to go for this budget ask or they're not necessarily happy that you're putting legislation forward. And if possible, even before you get your plan in motion, try to get that sense of the field prior, because it sounds corny. If you can enlist them, if you can hear their concerns, address them, then you have even a stronger presentation. And those groups that may have normally been at odds at each other, when Nora said anyone can go and testify in a public hearing, yay or nay to testimony, you don't want to be caught off guard by folks who are like, they did not consider the civil, and I'm making this up, you know, the civil liberties implications of what they're proposing. Not only does it show that you haven't done enough work, but um, you haven't reached out to folks who may have some concerns. So there's, you know, we're talking about budget advocacy and legislative advocacy. I'd put that in for the legislative, you know, be careful um, when you put something forward. It's a really great idea. Take the time to talk to people who may disagree with you. Yeah, those are all great points. I don't know if I have much to add, but totally second everything that was said. I think um, personally, like, I think you, something that is, heard a lot is like communication is key but I think in this case like comprehension is it's super important to have people understand what you're talking about and what like what exactly you're talking about or advocating for and um you know you put your plan to action by communicating your needs to be understood talk yeah talk to every single person you think could be impacted by this issue and like Tom said even people who disagree with you and don't necessarily think that what you're advocating for is important or not but it's important to engage in every single conversation so you know um, what exactly can come up when um, your bill um, is getting ready to be heard and what issues the, your legislators might have um, with it. So, and that being said, also like all the folks that you involve in with your advocacy, uh, make sure you have a shared goal and strategy. Um, it's very helpful um, when multiple organizations or people are advocating for the same exact thing, make sure you have the same ask and there's no confusion between um, what you versus somebody else is asking for. Um, and like Nora said, there's like a, it's hard to determine the line between like being persistent um, and maintaining that communication with your legislators and also realizing that you're being, it's too much and your legislator might tune you out at some point. I think just knowing like, maybe like, sketch, maybe like, talking to your legislator first and getting their support. And if that's not the case, if there's like a legislator who probably won't support it and support your bill and just move on, I think that there's like just knowing that there might be some person who just won't support it and no amount of convincing is going to help. You can focus that energy on people who can be convinced or focus that energy on preparing for a hearing to like share your experiences um, via testimony. So I think just being consistent and persistent, but not in a way, like Nora said, that can be just someone's going to tune you out. Um, and then there's like specific like action items that you can do, right? Like you can contact your legislator to co-sponsor a bill and then thank them for support to show that um, you you really appreciate them taking the time to support your bill. And a great way to do this is on social media. Like that's a great way to share um, your perspectives and your um, issues that your community is facing on social media so you can get more people engaged. I think I always love those social media graphics and just making it, making things as easily understood as possible. Um, yeah, just set up a, I think it's helpful for, for myself, especially just to set up a timeline, like make a map about where are, when are times that I need to be plugged in um, 
when this, like for the specific bill, one, like right now, it's time to ask for uh, co-sponsorships. The next thing is waiting for, since committees are, since bills have been assigned to committees, like when, when is the hearing for this bill going to be scheduled? And when that happens, I need to get everyone together so we can um, work on testimony together, both written and like oral testimony, and we can kind of continue that advocacy. So just knowing where in the year you are and like where things can come up like that's super helpful and then you can build a timeline for yourself um, for just specific action items that you or your organization uh, wants to do thank you and i completely agree gratitude goes a long way um so our our legislators who kind of use their political capital and and put their necks out for a lot of the stuff that we're advancing uh, we want to make sure that they know that we appreciate it um, and, you know, we consider them a, a champion and the hope obviously is that they will continue to do so um, down the line. So very much agree with that. Um, the last question that we have today, um, and if anybody has in the audience has any other questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A. We have a couple more minutes, uh, but this is a great opportunity to kind of plug what each of us are kind of focusing on in the moment. Um, but now everybody kind of has a better understanding of how to get involved, what that looks like. And so now you want to put that into action. Um, so the question that we received is, what policies are in the works now that we, as the audience, uh, can advocate for as stakeholders? Nithya, I'll start with you. That's a great question. I think I can put uh, JDI's list of priorities in the chat. If there are any priorities that interest anybody. Um, we're working on a bunch of initiatives related to uh, sexual violence and domestic violence and other intersectional issues. For example, um, I think, like I mentioned before, um, a lot of our bills have been assigned to committees and we're waiting um, on hearings, but it's a great time right now to build that relationship with your legislator, um, ask for co-sponsorship and prepare um, like mentally, emotionally for a time where you can um, in the next coming months to give either written or oral testimony. At this very moment, it's budget season. So we're advocating for um, level funding from fiscal year 23 for our DPH line item on sexual and domestic violence services. Um, the number is 4513-1136 for any, anyone. I think this is, for me, I think the budget is like the most important thing to advocate for because funding is essential to do literally anything else. Um, so this is a good time to actually talk to your legislators. Uh, I think right now, so the ne next week, the House is going to vote on the budget and then um, the Senate is going to take it up in May. It's a great time to, are there any amendments that you're supporting? I know Tom might highlight a few um, that you're supporting or your organization is supporting. Great time to communicate with the House to the full uh, chamber to kind of talk about why you're supporting it and then continue that um, when the uh, budget um, takes place in the Senate. So there are so many different things that are happening right now and I can just plug our priorities in the chat. If anybody has any questions or wants to get involved, please email me. I'll put my email in the chat as well. Any form of advocacy at any time is just super great and um, we'll welcome it. So thank you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, yeah, and um, I will also say um, Mass Children's Science as a coalition for children, um, we always want, we never want to, and I don't know if, I hope this is an okay expression, like Rob Peter to pay Paul. We don't want one cause to say, well, ours is more important than Nithya's. It's the opposite. We want to, even though we have different amendments, we always say we're a continuum of services. If there is one break in this, long services everyone's going to pay you know you can't artificially separate children from women from you know lgbtq folks who are you know whose programming is is being um eked away so it's really powerful and wonderful in massachusetts that we really do um, like to put ourselves forward um and i would say yes please support uh, the initiatives that jane does put forward um we have a couple things that we're putting forward um uh, we have our amendment for Children's Advocacy Center funding. I'll put that in the chat. Um, and uh, that's for the House budget. So the House has done their budget. Now we're scrambling for them to say, well, wait, 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 forgot about something. We'd like you to add to that. Um, and again, I'll use this example. Uh, Rep Whips sits on the Child Sexual Abuse Prevention Task Force. I didn't know her. And over the last five years, we realized, whoa, we, we know a lot. 
And if you stop her on the street right now and say, hey, what do you know about your advocacy center? She'll blow you away. I and mean, she really will just uh, this have all of this wonderful information coming at you. And you may have to hold on to something because it's with so much uh, enthusiasm. So someone we wouldn't have identified years ago, um, we now are going to, and she's one of our champions. Um, we also have legislation um, in the works that is being uh, referred on both sides, House and Senate, to the uh, Committee on Children, Family, and Persons with Disabilities. And it's a simple bill enacting um, or enabling uh, our work. So it's an act relative to children's advocacy centers in the Massachusetts Children's Alliance. And uh, we would love for you to look into that and uh, ask your legislator to support it. In the Senate, it's uh, bill number 74. And, in the and that's been filed by Senator Sear, one of our champions. And another is uh, in the House side, it's number 161, and that's Rep um, Finn, who also became a real champion of our work out in Springfield, in West Springfield area. Great, and I will throw our priorities link in the chat. I, I talked a little bit about it in uh, the presentation. Um, in regards to the budget, we are uh, currently making decisions on budget um, amendments to prioritize and over the next uh, 24 hours, we'll be making those those final calls. But to Thomas' point, all of these things are so interconnected that um, it, you know we prioritize from a capacity perspective. It is uh, just me and then our members. Um, mm -hmm. So trying to figure out how we can be effective, um, it, it is not always an indication of sort of level of support, but really the, the very human sort of capacity limits. Um, so we'll see, we'll see what comes out in the budget. Thank you all. And I'd be remiss if I didn't plug the VOCA bridge is very much still moving forward. Um, we are two thirds of the way there. Um, and there is some movement on that last remaining $20 million um, thanks to a bill that Governor Healy filed um, a couple of weeks ago. So for folks who are already signed up to our policy updates, you will continue to be kind of updated on the movement there. Um, but Brenna is putting in the chat a link. So if there's anybody who is not already on that list and would like to be, please sign up. Um, and that's another way to just hear about what MOVA's doing, um, not just related to the VOCA Bridge, but all of our kind of policy advocacy work. So please feel free to sign up there. And I know we're a little bit beyond. So Tom, Nithya, Nora, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for sharing your expertise. It takes a village. We know that it takes teamwork to get any of this done. We are all on the same side, um, even though, as you said, we have our um, you know differing priorities sometimes. But thank you so much for all your partnership and collaboration. Thank, thank you, you so much for having us. Thank you. And just really quick, I will echo Stephanie and say thank you to Nora, Tom, Nithya, and to you too, Steph. I'll also say thank you to our ASL interpreters that were with us today, as well as our CART captioners. Um, Charlotte just put a whole bunch of information in the chat, which included some resources. Um, and Charlotte will also follow up via email with all attendees and provide that information as well. Um, sorry for going a few minutes over, but I'm really glad that we were able to have such an insightful and thoughtful and detailed conversation today. So thank you so much to everyone who joined us and to all of our panelists. Have a great day, everyone.